Why We Love the Tang Dynasty, exploring the history and charm of what's seen as one of the greatest imperial dynasties in Chinese history. Episode 13, Tang Music in Action. In this episode, we're continuing our survey of music in the Tang Dynasty to further explore how a guiding imperial hand can influence the development of the arts for generations to come. I'm Bob Jones, and in this podcast series, we're getting to know the Tang Dynasty and attempting to discover how, at its height, it was possibly the most prosperous, interconnected and innovative country in the world, with a rich and influential legacy that survives to this day. Picture the scene. The year is 690 AD. A great banquet is being held to celebrate the ascension of Wu Zetian. Her young grandchildren have lined up to perform a doll song and a dance routine. Wearing a mask and wielding a handheld weapon, five-year-old Li Fan performs a dance called the King of Lan Ling. Lan Ling was one of ancient China's foremost generals who met a tragic end. He was apparently so beautiful that he had to wear a mask to hide his looks. Otherwise, his enemies would become enchanted and not take him seriously. But his mask made him brave, and his tactics and skills were later commemorated by a dance. Li Fan was followed by a succession of children, the youngest of which was just four years old, dancing with childish enthusiasm for their grandmother amidst the grand surroundings. How do we know all this? Well, the details of this event are carved into a tombstone belonging to Princess Li Hua, inscribed to let later generations know that there was some happiness amidst all the dynastic machinations of the time. All around these children, the adults were plotting, and falsely accusing, and assassinating, and manoeuvring. And yet, the music played on. Maybe all this music and creativity was a distraction from the negative events of the time. There is a Western saying, possibly originating in the Bible, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we will die. But music during the Tang period was far from homogenous. What you would have heard at the start of the dynasty would have been quite different from that experienced at the end, especially at court. The seeds of change were sown early on by Emperor Taizong. He often pondered on the role that music played in public life and how some argued that it could even bring down dynasties through its melancholy. His point was, don't blame the music. Appreciation of music had much to do with the inner emotions of the listener. A happy person would feel joy at hearing music. A heavy-hearted person would become sad. But could music destroy a dynasty? No. Could it help in building one? Yes. It could and should. His views were echoed by Emperor Xuanzong, Li Longzhi, who was likewise obsessed with music. He loved playing all sorts of instruments, particularly the jie gu, a kind of drum. It's said that he filled a whole cabinet with drumsticks he had broken through enthusiastic playing. It's also claimed he even dreamed music. One day, a courtier noticed him tapping his fingers on his stomach and feared the emperor was unwell. He explained to the worried courtier that he had had a dream whereby he had toured the heavenly palace and the fairies had played beautiful music. When he woke, he feared he might forget the music, so he hid his flute underneath his gown and was practicing the notes in case he should forget. By all accounts, he was a musical genius along the lines of Mozart. He could write music at will, off the top of his head. In all, he composed and rearranged 14 musical pieces. 
Gaining a valuable child was said to have been composed for his beloved concubine Yang Guifei, she of the legend of the demon cat, who arguably did do much to bring down a dynasty. And ringing bells in the rain was composed to express his mournful thought. Xuanzong's way of thinking is that music should live in the moment and always voice new ideas. He often took charge of the training of musicians in the Pear Garden Academy he set up. And, as we've mentioned earlier, this royal interest in music very often defined the direction and tone of music in the Tang Dynasty and through succeeding generations. Even before the Tang Dynasty, music in China was broad and interesting. The courts employed special troops who would perform the best local and foreign music. The most important music was the Yan Yue, which was performed during the royal banquet and most parts were played by Western musical instruments. Emperor Xuanzong took the radical step of recategorizing the troupe into just two. There was the standing court team and the sitting court team. The sitting team sat on an indoor stage in the royal palace. They were mainly singers with a small number of dancers and the more restrained instruments. The standing troupe was made up of louder instruments which played outside in the main hall. Three music institutions were established with an overarching body with the Tai Chang Se in control of them all. The Da Yue Bureau organized music for ceremonial occasions like banquets. It also was in charge of musicians' examinations. To become a professional musician in the Tang Dynasty, you need to study for maybe up to 15 years and then pass exams to prove your ability and gain status. You had to master 50 very difficult pieces in order to become a graduate. The Sir Ju Bureau looked after percussion and wind music for processions. Finally, the Music Conservatory was responsible for music education and the training of dancers and musicians. The Tang, as we know, loved organization and administration. Whereas today this restructuring may look quite commonplace, it must have seemed revolutionary at the time. Certainly not something that a mere official or musician could achieve. Such advancements needed the power of an emperor to put into motion. A brief survey here of the type of instruments that you might find in the Tang Dynasty. Once again, we can see a seismic shift in tastes, largely due to the influences from an ever-growing empire. The sa, a kind of plucked zither instrument with up to 50 strings, and the yu, a bamboo wind instrument, were beginning to fall out of favour. But the pipa was growing in popularity. This stringed instrument from the western regions sat alongside the shichin and huqin, other stringed instruments. There were also little percussion instruments. Sounds were changing. The Tang poet Bai Zhu Yi was entranced especially by the pipa. He wrote, The bold strings rattled like splatters of sudden rain. The fine strings hummed like lovers' whispers, chattering and pattering, pattering and chattering, as pearls large and small on a jade plate fall. The sweet melody recalls orioles singing among the flowers. The sobbing music brings the gushing out of glaciers. To begin with, though, the tongue liked their music big. A 
song, dance and instrumental style became highly popular. The Dagu or Grand Peace. These were no minor events. It was often made up of 50 or so pieces involving huge numbers of performers. The palace also engaged a variety of acrobats and dancers skilled in using swords, ropes and poles. They would perform in front of the palace. This would often happen before, during and after a banquet as an entertainment and a spectacle. Singing, dancing, horse shows, circuses with rhinos and elephants, perhaps a little comic opera or even comedians thrown in for good measure. The music of the Tang dynasty not only reflected the glory of the age with big production numbers and grand staging, it also reflects the way the Tang dynasty thought. It liked order and justice. The music had to fit into a system, even though that system allowed a huge variety of styles and techniques. It was advanced by powerful emperor musicians, but of course not all emperors are strong and even strong emperors must die sometime. As the Tang dynasty began to falter, after the An Lushan rebellion especially, then further changes began to take place. Music became more introverted and in tune with nature. We'll find out more in our next podcast. Special thanks go out to San Lian Zhongdu for their help in creating the content for this show. This is Bob Jones. Thanks for listening. Join me again next time.